So this is what we will be creating today. Uh, it will be a fairly simple setup. We have a character which we are creating as an AI. We give it some very simple logic and the logic is essentially to ask the smart object subsystem to say, hey, which smart objects are available to me within a certain area? And we have one of these cones representing one of these smart objects, which in this case has two slots. A slot each is a position that you can claim reservation for. So the AI will be saying, find these objects for me. It will take the first object, which is this one, because we only have one currently. And then from that, it will say, I want to claim a slot. It will walk up to the slot. It will uh, do an animation to sort of display the, uh, in quotation marks, usage of that slot. But you could have all kinds of logic in there, of course. And once it's done with the animation, it is going to uh, release this slot so it could be claimed by someone else if they wanted to and then after a little bit of wait it's going to be uh, trying to claim it again and jump again so if we press play this is what we have playing out here essentially so the ai is walking up jumping releasing the slot and then waiting for a bit and then taking the slot again and then so this is now essentially the ai interacting with the the smart object in the world so that's what we will be creating a big thank you to all of you who like, comment, subscribe and share my videos, or through other means support this channel. You are what makes this channel grow and become a resource for other people to learn from. Enough about how awesome you are, back to the video. Welcome back. So in this video we're going to be highlighting uh, the smart objects that are available in 5.1 as full release. Uh, so what I have here is a third person template uh, that is created in Unreal Engine 5.1 Preview 1. And you can see that we have some project settings that are incorrect. So we're going to go to project settings and platform and windows and SM6, I believe it is. Yes. And dismiss. And then we want to restart. So I'll see you in a moment. Okay. Now that we're back, let's start creating some smart objects then. So uh, starting off, a smart object is essentially going to be an actor in the world that has a smart object component on it. So let's go start creating that. We'll create a folder even for this so we have it neat. Uh, smart object, like so. And inside of here we'll create an actor. So we've got blueprints and we say actor. Say bp underscore smart object. Uh, let's call this a telephone because that's for example, what it could be a telephone that an AI walks up to and then starts making a call or something like that. If you're too young to know what a tel telephone booth is, it was before smartphones were a thing. Um, essentially, uh, what we do here is we open up this blueprint and inside of it, we want to add a, a smart object component. So to add a component, we would just do the normal thing. We would go here and add and then type in smart object. Unfortunately, we don't have it available here in the list when we search for it. And the reason for that, we don't have the proper plugin available. Uh, so we'll go to plugins and we'll type in smart. And from here, we want to enable smart objects. And yes, and it says in beta because it's in beta in, in the preview one, but it should be in full release uh, once it's out in the full 5.1 version. So we'll restart from here. Now that we have restarted, we can close the plugins down and we can now add our uh, object here. So if we add an object, a component and type in smart object, you can see that we get a smart object component that we can add here. So we'll just add that here. And if we go to the viewport, you can actually not see any representation of it here. Uh, but it is it is here anyway. But uh, to make this visually uh, distinguishable in the level, we may want to add a static mesh just so we can see something in the world here. Where Oh, that's not what I wanted. Uh, just so we have something that represents uh, the objects we can see where it is essentially. Uh, so we'll add a static, static mesh here and we can pick whatever we want, essentially a, uh, uh, let's pick a cone. So here's our cone and this represents our object and our smart object is in the same position as this object. Okay, so next step is we need to configure our smart object because our smart object now in the world is essentially going to be 
an object that the subsystem keeps track of, uh, that it allows us to have a framework to work against, uh, which will have a certain amount of slots on it uh, that are sort of uh, positions that you can reserve or claim as the terminology is going to be used. Uh, and to configure a smart object, uh, so this is this actor is now essentially a smart object in, in that sense, uh, but we need to define an asset for it here. So this is a data asset that it wants, and we currently do not have any data assets, so we need to create one of those, so we have one available. So we'll compile and save for now. So to create a corresponding data asset, we'll just bring up our browser, right click, and we'll go to miscellaneous and the data asset. And from here, we can just type in smart and we'll see a smart object definition. So we'll choose that, call this a DA smart object definition, that should be fine. We have now created one of those. We can now go into our uh, object here and choose our smart object definition. Bam, everything is done and configured in our blueprint uh, class that is now a smart object. Uh, we now need to configure how this actually works. So to do that, we open up our data asset. And this is our data asset. Uh, currently, we don't see anything in here. Uh, we need to do a few things here. Like I mentioned earlier, we have something called slots when it comes to smart objects. And this is to denote how many uh, positions you can have when you interact with this object or when you're somehow coupled with this object. Uh, so if we were to add one slot here, like so, you can see that we get a representation in here and we get some uh, information about it. So this here represents our position for this specific slot in the world in relation to the object that it has. So starting off, we have something called an offset. The offset here will change if I move this around, as you can see. And the offset will be a position as an offset to where it is positioned inside of the Blueprint class. So since this one is uh, in the, the center of 000 on the root of this object, if we were to put it uh, 100 units to the left, it would essentially mean that it would be uh, one meter to the left uh, of this Blueprint class uh, when we put uh, an object into the world. Uh, we can leave it at, at zero for now, that should be fine. Um, the next thing we need to do here is we need to set up a behavior, how uh, we're supposed to be interacting with this smart object, essentially. You can have uh, different behaviors for different slots. So uh, if you look here on the index zero, this is representing our, our only slots that we currently have, uh, we can add a behavior here. Uh, and choosing from here, we get a list that is uh, essentially empty. But uh, to quickly describe this first, uh, this behavior would then be the behavior of this slot. And if we had another slot here that didn't have a behavior, uh, we could have a default behavior that could uh, kick in in case we do not have a behavior. So uh, you can define them per slot basis if you want to. Uh, we'll just go ahead and delete that. And now we need to add this uh, behavior here to our uh, definition. To do so, we need to add a, another plugin. So we'll go to plugins again and we'll type in smart. That's not how you spell smart. That's not very smart of me. Uh, so this gameplay behavior smart objects is the plugin that we need this time. So we'll just choose that one and then restart it. Okay, now that we have restarted once more, we can close the plugins down here and we can go to our behavior definition here and say that we want to have a gameplay behavior smart object behavior definition. Not quite a mouthful, but yeah, so that's what we choose there. And now we have the like uh, overarching uh, class available, uh, but we still need to choose a gameplay behavior config here. And you see that we by default have a few here, but we will actually be setting up one of these for ourselves. So opening up our browser again, we can choose to create a class and we can type in uh, config and we should find a gameplay behavior config. So selecting this, we can call it BP 
behavior config. Actually, let's call it gameplay behavior config. So it's very clear uh, what the type is here. That's a little bit too many Bs, like so. Okay, so now we have a class of the type gameplay, gameplay behavior config. I actually spelled that really wrong. Let's, one moment. Uh, play behavior, there we go. Uh, opening this up, we'll see that this class is fairly empty and you don't have a whole lot of it, but you can see that we have a behavior class over here. Again, we have a few by default, but we will be setting up our own behavior class. So next step, we'll right click and create another blueprint and we type in smart. That's not how you type smart. And here, no, actually we're after our, um, oh, what's it called? I'm blanking. I'm so sorry. Uh, behavior class. Uh, let's see here, uh, behavior, gameplay behavior. I'm sorry, that was my phone, not yours. Uh, call this BP gameplay behavior, like so. And now we can choose the BP gameplay behavior from here. So now we have that set up. So we have our own classes for these configs now. So now you might be thinking, okay, we have set up all of these classes. What do they actually do? Well, if we open up our gameplay behavior here. This uh, will correspond to essentially what we want. To, uh, in this case, we're going to be creating an AI and the behavior here will determine how the character will behave once it has arrived at one of these smart objects and is going to interact with it essentially. And we're going to be keeping it fairly simple, but uh, in the functions here, we have some override uh, functions uh, that you can hook in logic to. And what we're going to be doing is here on the is the on the triggered character, which is uh, the event that will happen when the AI will arrive at the smart object. Uh, so we have the, a, the avatar here, which is the character object reference. We have a config and we have a smart object owner. So we have a few different references that we can make use of. So we will be keeping this very, very simple. Uh, what we will be doing is uh, we'll just be playing a montage when an AI character comes and is uh, behaving in uh, this slot, essentially. Uh, so we'll take our uh, avatar here and we'll get a component by class. And we'll make sure to get our uh, skeletal mesh. This way we can call on the skeletal mesh and say we want to play a montage. Uh, the issue right now is that this project doesn't have a montage setup, so we need to create one of those quickly. So we'll go to our character, mannequin, animation, and we'll just... Uh, actually, not, that's the wrong mannequin. This mannequin, animations, can go into queen, I guess. Uh, don't have anything there. Here we have a jump. So a jump will create a animation montage. Default name is fine. That should be good enough for us. So now we can choose our jump montage over here. So now we have a jump montage that is going to be playing once this event happens. Uh, after that, we can either complete it or we could get interrupted here essentially. Uh, in either case, we want to say that we're essentially done. So we'll uh, can we actually get avatar? We cannot because it's an event. So we'll go over here and we'll type in end behavior. So at this point, we're gonna say that we're done. And we're gonna do that when we have completed or when we have been interrupted like so. To make this a little bit more clear, we can go out here and we can, let's find our folder smart objects and let's rename the gameplay behavior which is we, what we're currently editing here and change it to uh, gameplay behavior jump so we know, because that's what we're doing we're jumping on a montage right and our gameplay config which is essentially just pointing to this gameplay behavior jump we might as well also rename to jump in the end and this now if we go back to our data asset which we're defining our smart object. This is where we set our config and we can now say that it should be making use of our config for jump, which in turn 
is calling on the gameplay behavior for jump, which in turn is saying that when the on-triggered character event happens, we should be playing a jump montage and then ending the behavior saying that we're done. So now we have connected all of these things together. So now we have one large chunk uh, done, but now we need to have an AI to display this happening because we won't have anything it won't make much sense until we do. So let's create an AI. Uh, we'll start off by going to our uh, artificial intelligence. We'll create a behavior tree. We can call it bt underscore AI, just to keep it super simple. We can create a artificial intelligence blackboard. Again, just calling it uh, bb AI, to keep it super simple. Go into the behavior tree, make sure that it's making use of our blackboard like it should. That's good. So from here, let's create something very simple. We'll just drag out and have a sequence or something like that. And we want to create some tasks now for us. So the first task we want to have is the AI to identify a smart object in the world and then get to that uh, object and then use it and then, uh, I don't know, wait or something like that. Uh, so first of all, we want to create a task that will find us the objects. So we'll create a new task we can call it um, ETT find smart object, something like that. And we'll override the receive execute AI, which is the event that happens when uh, this behavior task gets its uh, execution for the AI. And from here, what we want to do is we want to access uh, the smart object subsystem. Right clicking and typing in smart object subsystem, you can see that we have a world subsystem here. And this is the subsystem that keeps track of the different smart objects in the world. So uh, from this one, we can say we want to uh, find a smart object or multiples if we want to. Let's find the smart, let's find all of them. Find smart objects, like so. And it will require you to have a request to limit the amount of smart objects that it knows about. So if we drag out from this, we can say we want to make a structure for this. And this structure consists of two things. One is a query box, which will denote the, uh, the, the area in which it should be filtering uh, the smart objects available. And one that is a filter for the actual uh, smart objects themselves. Uh, let's start off with the filter. If we go out like so and make a smart object filter structure, you can see that we can add some tags for a user and some activity requirements. And we also have some behavior definition clauses. So these are all things that you can have. So you can have tags on your smart objects to make sure that you find certain objects for a certain category or something like that based on gameplay tags that you set up. Um, for us, we're going to be taking everything, so we're just going to be creating an array for this. Uh, so we'll uh, type in make array, and we're going to be adding the class here of gameplay behavior, smart object behavior. So those are all that we're filtering. So essentially, we're not filtering out anything based on this. So now we need to make a query box to say uh, where, in which area do we want to find the smart objects. So we'll make a box. A box will take a minimum and maximum uh, vector for it. So what we can do here is we can, for example, take our controlled pawn, which has a position in the world. So we can get the actor location from that. Uh, from here, we can say that we want to have an area that is rel relative to this character. So we can say uh, minus, which will give us a minus vector. And we can also add a plus which will give us a plus vector. And then we can add some values here to say that we want to scan within them. So in the documentation, for example, they're giving the example of 2000. So we can do exactly that, meaning that we will have a uh, 20 meter boundary extended in each direction from our character. And we can hook this up as our minimum and maximum. And that is uh, how we now limit that uh, grouping of smart objects that are relevant to us. Um, from here, we now get a 
uh, array over here. So we can say, let's keep this simple and just get the very first smart object that we find. So we can just type in a get and we'll take the index zero. And this one is the one that we're going to be uh, wanting to have. Now, uh, this is now going to be a smart object request result. And those are used to, uh, in conjunction with the, the concept of claiming. Uh, if we drag out from our smart object subsystem here, we can type in claim, for example, and we can see that this is a smart object function that we have available to us. Uh, this function takes in, uh, first of all, the subsystem as a reference, and it will take a smart object request result, which is what we have gathered here. So we can hook it up like so. So that means that this object that we find here, we will now try to claim. So if we were to hook this up like so, in theory, we would now scan around us for all smart objects, get the first one and claim it. That's what the AI would do with this uh, function now, essentially. So essentially now we could theoretically finish if we wanted to. So we could type in finish execute and we could say that it's a success, for example, uh, even though it might not have been. Um, but we may want to actually keep track of this smart object. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to be going to our uh, behavior tree. Uh, we can first of all add our task that we have created, our find smart objects. And after that, we'll go to our blackboard. And from here, we're going to add in, be adding a new key. And we'll type in a smart object. That's not what it's called. It's called smart. Right. We don't have everything that we need yet. We need to go and do the following. We need to add another plugin, I believe. So if we go here and we type in uh, AI behavior, maybe. No, that one is already activated. I think this is what we should be needing. Let's go back to our blackboard again. New key. Let's see. Maybe I spelled it wrong. There we go. SO claim handle. It's not called smart uh, object. It's called just SO claim handle key. So, so here we have a smart object claim handle key. So we'll call this uh, uh, smart object and claim key or something like that. That should be fine. Uh, going back to our uh, task now, we can say that we may want to say that whatever result we find here, we want to expose outwards. Uh, so we'll open up the, the task again and we'll add a variable and we can call this uh, found smart object. Make it of a uh, blackboard key selector. Uh, compile and we'll make sure to make it instance editable and we can go back to our uh, behavior tree and we can say that we want to have it of the SO claim key here. Uh, so that means that the result from this will be stored in the SO claim key over here, uh, which is nice and, and sweet from us for, for the outside here. So now we just need to make sure that it actually happens. So Dragging out this reference here now, we can say we want to set this. Set. Okay. It seems like my UI is acting up a little bit. So you can see here we have a set blackboard value, a smart object claim handle. And this is what we want to do. Uh, in this case here, when we have claimed here, you can see that we have a smart object claim handle. Uh, but we may not have a handle here at this point, depending on what if we had a, um, well, first of all, we might not be able to claim it depending on the situations and we might not actually have a value here. There might not be any available um, objects, smart objects for us to find. So we may want to have a branch here, making sure that it actually exists. So we can check this one and say, uh, not valid, let's check against, Let's check the length here and say if this one is greater than zero. Then we have a handle. Actually, let's do it this way. It will be nicer, I think. Um, 
let's take because if we have we get zero here and we can't get one it should be getting us an invalid um, claim here so we'll just type in uh, valid like so and have it hook up to our branch Okay, so if this is true, we have a valid smart handle, we can say that we want to go here and the value we want to send in is the one that we have just claimed over here. Uh, in this case, we can say that we have a success, otherwise we have a fail. Uh, so we can essentially say we want to have our success be determined by this variable over here. And have our false also input into our finish execute like so. I'll try to clean this up a little bit for us so it maybe it's a little bit more visible. So, so we're trying to claim our handle. We're checking if it's valid. If it is valid, we're storing it in our um, key selector and then finishing. If it is not valid, we're falsing and saying that we did not succeed and we're not setting it. Uh, we could also if we already had something set here, we could clear it in the false branch here. Uh, we'll see what we do later on. Uh, let's move on. So for now, uh, we should be able to find our object here. So now the next part is to actually make use of that handle. So let us create a new task for this. So we can create a new task and we can say we want to have it on that base. We want to call it uh, use smart object. Uh, in this one, we'll overwrite again the execute AI. We'll try to keep this a little bit uh, simpler. Uh, we essentially want to make use of a, a smart object here. Uh, so we'll need to have it somehow uh, sent into this um, task. So we'll create a function for this or a variable, which we will call uh, smart objects to use. We'll make it of the type key selector. Again, expose it so that way we can send it in. So we'll go to our behavior tree, we'll call on our new task we created, which is use smart object and say that uh, the smart object that we want to use is the, the claimed key that we already have now from this one over here. Uh, going back in here again, we're gonna be saying that, okay, this smart object here, uh, we need to make sure that it is of a smart object uh, claim handle. So we'll get blackboard, value as smart object claim handle. Again, a little bit of a mouthful, but it's descriptive at least. From that, we can drag out and say, actually, I think it might not be available here. Let's see, uh, use claim, oh, that works fine, okay. So here we can say we want to make use of the gameplay behavior smart object, and it wants a controller, and we have a controller over here. And that's that. And you can see that this is an asynchronous task because of the, the clock. Um, and after this, we can essentially say that, okay, we have when we've completed this, then we're done with this object. So let's say that we, we don't want to have this object anymore saved in our Blackboard. So we can clear our Blackboard value. Make sure to do that on both succeed and on fail, let's say. Actually, let's do it like this. So on succeeded, we can have like so. And then we do a finish execute and say that if we completed, then we get a success. And otherwise we have a fail, let's say. So we'll do a fail done. Actually, we want to clear this still, I think. So let's do it like this. And clear it and then send it here and say, so we failed to do the thing we wanted to do here. Okay, so this, this is not uh, that complicated. We have a, a claim uh, on smart object handle, essentially. We make use of it. Uh, once it's used, uh, we clear it out from the blackboard, and then we say that we're finished with this task, uh, depending on how it went. Uh, so that's all there. And then maybe we want to have something like a wait, just so we can uh, catch our breath a little bit, I guess. Uh, now, this is not going to be working optimally to begin with, but uh, let's start here and then uh, fine-tune it as we go along a little bit and discuss about what's happening. 
To finish off the AI, we want to create a controller for our AI. Let's say these things. Uh, so we'll do a blueprint class and say AI controller. And there we go. And we can just call it BP AI controller. That's a fine name. And inside of this one, the only thing we want to say is essentially that on begin play, we want to run a behavior tree. And we're going to be running the behavior tree we have just created, which is the BTAI. So that's all for this controller. We can save this. Uh, now we need to make sure that our character makes use of this um, uh, this controller when it's being put in the world. So our uh, third person character here we have, it has by default, as an AI controller, it has, uh, let's see here, there, the default AI controller class. So we change it to our BP AI controller. So it's going to be making use of that if we have an, a character in the world that's not possessed by us. Um, next, we need to actually place our character in the world. So we'll make sure to put one in the world and we can type in possessed, make sure that it's disabled. So it's going to be made, made use of the AI. And in addition to that, we want to place a smart object in the world which we have created, which is this one. So let's put it over here, sort of next to our AI. That'll be fine. Actually, maybe let's let's start. Let's put it by pressing end key. We get its um, pivot point is in the middle, so it's a little bit going to be in the through the ground. But that's that's fine for our purposes. So from here, let's just play and see what happens. So starting off, we can see our character. It's standing still. Uh, I'm also getting some artifacting, which is interesting. Uh, we can go into our debug mode and we can see that our character here is just uh, spamming. Uh, we can see that it's getting a, uh, a smart object over here. Uh, not very easy to read, of course, but we can see that it's a slot zero of a specific object and the user, I'm not entirely sure of uh, what is representing. Uh, we can see that we also have a smart object uh, debug functionality up here, which we can uh, toggle and uh, toggle off by pressing the six key. Uh, and we can see that it's uh, typing out found smart object SO claim key over there as well. Uh, so here we can see some information like runtime objects, blah, 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 and, and things related to smart objects. But our character or our AI is currently not uh, doing anything. If we look, we can see it's uh, standing inside of the find smart object and just completing it very quickly, I believe. So if we open up like this, we can see that this is the only thing that it's doing. And if we go in here and we put the breakpoint, we can debug and see what's happening here is we're uh, going to our smart object subsystem. Uh, we're trying to get our objects and we're getting zero here. Now, the reason why we're getting zero in this case is because, whoa, we close that down so it doesn't happen. Uh, what, what's happening here is that um, we need to have, for, for the smart system, uh, for the subsystem for smart objects to be able to find all the objects that is available to it, it needs to have world partition enabled for the map. So to enable a world partition, because this map, if you go here, we have a category or a tab here for world partition. There's not a whole lot going on here. You can find it if you don't have the window available here. You can find it under window. And um, world partition editor over here. Uh, anyway, so going to the world settings, we want to uh, let's type in partition. We have a world partition setup here. We want to enable streaming. Enable streaming. Uh, this will uh, set up the stream. Continue. Yes. Uh, refer to documentation. No. So now you can see that the world disappeared. And that's the reason for that is that the world is not loaded. So going to our tab for world partition now, we can just uh, mark everything here by right, uh, dragging and marking everything and then right clicking and then choosing a load region. We could, if we wanted to load everything here, there seems to be a lot here. It doesn't really matter that much because we only have this little area here that's available. But now it's loaded at least because we can see it now. 
So if we were to start playing again, and actually let's remove this to begin with and then play, you can see that our character is standing over there still doing nothing. So why is that? Well, it might be a little bit clearer if we go in the find task again and we play and we walk through this one and we can see that we get a result here. We have actually found our smart object now. Uh, the problem here is that we're finding the smart object, we're claiming the smart object, and we're resuming. Uh, if I resume, you can see we get the event execute AI again for uh, this object, which means that if we go over here again and we check the number of results, we get one and we're claiming it, and we're getting here again, we're running here, and we're claiming it over and over again essentially like so the issue that we're having currently is that our ai doesn't actually have a nav mesh which is actually what would have prevented it from moving earlier as well so let's actually add our nav mesh um nav mesh bounds volume we'll add it to the world we'll scale it up a little bit 20 20 20 should be fine Pressing P, we can see that everything that's green is going to be handled by the nav mesh. So that's fine, and I should theoretically be able to move now. Uh, the issue here now will likely be that this cone is a static mesh that has collision on it. Uh, we don't want to have collision because we have actually placed the, the slot inside of it. So we want to be able to reach the, the slot without having collision in the way. So what we'll do is we'll open up our object, our static mesh, we'll navigate to where the cone is. And what we can do is we can drive the cone to our smart object and we'll say copy here. We'll rename the cone to something like uh, cone without collision, something like that. We open up the cone and the cone, you can see here have number of collision primitives four. We want to go to collision and say remove collision and now we have zero. So we'll save that and close that down. We don't have a collision anymore for the cone. That is great. Uh, we now need to go to our smart object and make sure that we use that mesh instead of this one. So we'll type in, or we actually can see it over here. So cone without collision, like so. Compile and save. And let's see how this works out for us now. Okay then, from here, let's press play and see what happens. So we can see our AI runs up to the object, does the animation, and then starts waiting for five seconds, and then it should be repeating. Yes. Uh, pressing our apostrophe key, we can go into debug, and we can see some of the information that's being handled here. And we can see that the ring that is available here now is green when it's available, and red when it's being interacted with. If we were to have the object in a different position, uh, maybe I can move it a little bit and maybe I can be fast enough to get the debug up. You can see that it's orange over there and then it's red. So it's orange while it is claimed but not currently being used by the AI. Um, so this is essentially the parts here now. And from here you could do some other things. You could go to uh, the data asset here. This one doesn't have a whole lot of visualization, but if we were to add a preview mesh, uh, let's say this one, and we say the collision, this one, we can see that this is now a representation of what our so-called telephone looks like. Uh, so we could, if we wanted to have a position over here, <clears throat> which uh, then would be represented in the world if we play, you can see that the character uh, is let's apostrophe you can see that the the circle is next to the cone now instead of inside of it and if we wanted to have multiple slots now we can go into our data asset to define that again and we can add another slot and we could have one that's identical and has the same behavior meaning i don't want to see this go away uh, the gameplay behavior and we say we want to be doing the the jumping config with this as well and this position is supposed to be not here but uh, let's say on this side of the cone if we now go and play 
and we go to our debug we can see that we now have two different circles that you could theoretically be interacting with here so there are two slots to reserve uh, which on the same object here uh, that you can be making use of it so that's how you can have multiple objects and then have them uh, located in different positions uh, to each other and sometimes this happens if you're unfortunate because again this is a preview it's not super stable but this happens sometimes okay so we're back from the crash uh, let's reiterate a little bit about what we have done here then essentially so we have created an object which is essentially an actor in the world which we have created into a smart object we have done so by adding a smart object component to it the smart object component by itself is defined by how it's supposed to be looking in the world by its data asset of the type smart object definition the data object sorry the data asset uh, we can set up and configure uh, partly uh, the slots, how they are positioned in relation to the object itself, and also what kind of configs we want to have for these different slots. These configs, they are, I lost my ordering here, uh, that's the jump behavior config. So our configs just point to a gameplay behavior so the, the configs themselves are empty except for that and the behaviors themselves we just put a very simple amount of code in which is that uh, on the event triggered by character we get the skeleton component so we can play a montage and then we end the behavior um, how this is driven is through our behavior tree our behavior tree has two tasks one to find a smart object one to use a smart object the finding smart object is a little bit involved essentially what we're saying is that once this task is called we are creating for the smart object subsystem a attempt to find smart objects and for that we are filtering certain objects in this case we're allowing everything that has gameplay smart object behavior definition so uh, we're not filtering anything more than that but we could be filtering on tags and stuff like that if we wanted to in addition to that we also have an area where we're looking in this case it is uh, located around the character in a box and we're using that to find which objects in the world that are available as smart objects for us we get the first one we say we claim it which means it becomes unavailable for others to to take it because it's now ours uh, and then we make a check if it's valid or not and then we save it in our blackboard so that we have it available outside in our behavior tree here so we can just expose it out here so we then can send it in to this smart object where or smart, this behavior tree task where we use the smart object and in here we don't do a whole lot we just get our handle and then we use the claimed uh, behavior smart object and once that has been used it will be uh, released allowing uh, this slot to be available for others to claim if they wanted to now uh, and then we just clear out our blackboard so we don't have it saved and we say that we're done with the execution here and in this uh, very simple example we just start waiting then and uh, repeat the process over and over so that is essentially how everything works together and from here you can of course expand upon this a lot and you can make use of it in a lot of different ways uh, you can have it as uh, things that ai walk up to and interact with like park benches or telephones or um, displays or anything like that that they walk up to and look and, and and do things and then proceed with their normal AI behavior afterwards so it's essentially creating points of interest for them it could be used in a multitude of other ways as well because uh, the AIs are not the only ones that can claim uh, these handles to these slots you can have a, a player character claim them as well if you wanted to um, so uh, you could have, I don't know, you could have a, a boat where each slot represents a, a specific position where one person is uh, rowing and another person is, is steering and another one is, I don't know, uh, looking at a, a binocular or something like that. There, there are a lot of use cases here and, and your imagination is probably the only limiting factor here, I would say. Um, so it's a little bit involved to get it in place to begin with but once you have it in place i think it's a fairly interesting system and can probably create quite living worlds as a consequence as well 
Anyway, I know this has been a long one, but that is all for now. Um, keep on learning. Take care. Hopefully you found this video helpful. If you liked the video, leave a like. If you did not like it, leave a dislike. Leave any suggestions or comments you have down below. Subscribe and share this video if you want to see more like it in the future. That is all for now. Keep on learning. Take care.